All right. Well, good evening, everyone. We're glad that you've uh, joined us again and once again to be with us as we continue our study of the various Parshas in the Torah. And tonight we're looking at Parsha Kukat, which begins in Numbers chapter 19 and goes through just the first verse of chapter 22. So really three chapters worth of, of material tonight. And Ben, I'd like to, to start last time uh, when we were together, we saw quite a few, bit of dissension against Moses and Aaron and their leadership and uh, uh, almost uh, a coup taking place. And that didn't work out too well for anybody. Uh, and that won't end. We're going to see that a little bit more in our Parsha this week. But we start with what um, is kind of a, an interesting, I think, uh, maybe even unique, but even something that is certainly different. And that is talking about a red cow uh, and uh, how that cow played into uh, God's commands of uh, people who were coming in contact uh, with corpse and so forth and uh, the different defects. And I'd just like to, if you could, maybe help us understand how not how the name of this Parsha, the Kukat, what that means and, and how the example of a red, uh, or how the uh, story of the red cow is an example of the explanation of uh, Kukat. And then we'll kind of go from there if that's all right. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and uh, it's good to have everybody again, and uh, we know that it's a sacrifice to meet here on Monday, and so we appreciate that. Um, there are um, a couple of words for God's statutes or commands. One is uh, mishpat, uh, and that's like judgments or something like that. Uh, can be statutes, I don't know. But the, the word that's usually translated statute is this word here, kukat. And the rabbis make a distinction between kukat and other words in that kukat, if you look at that word and you look at the context where it occurs, they say that the, it, it defies human intelligence of, of that command. In other words, you can't through human intelligence, determine what that command is. And they say, I couldn't get my iPad to work that has my notes, so I'm using my phone and it's real small. But uh, they say that this is the, uh, the, the quintessential example of a Kukat Torah. You see it there in verse two, this is the Kukat of Torah. This is the statute of the law requirement of the law the niv has and so it's it this means it's beyond human understanding and uh, they say because satan and the other nations taunt israel and say what's the purpose uh, of the commandment then uh, the torah says it's it's god who gave it and it's not for anyone to question it so that, that doesn't mean that um, since they're the products of God's intelligence, that um, if humans can't comprehend why God gave it, then it doesn't matter. It, it, God has his reasons, and we might not be able to understand those reasons. So there is, I, I don't subscribe to the idea, and I don't think the rabbis did, that, um, that there is no reason behind God's commands. I would say the fundamental reason behind God's commands is he says, you be holy as I'm holy. Now, we cannot maybe understand the relationship of some of these. And that's how they pictured this word kukat. And especially here with this red cow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on the one hand, as you said, uh, it, you didn't quite use this word, but I know it's, it's somewhat axiomatic in the sense that all of God's laws uh come from his intelligence and yeah. you know there there is an understanding behind them whether or not we do whether or not we understand them as something else but yeah when you look at this it's not just any cow it's a red cow and then what's supposed to be done with this red cow and how uh, in essence the red cow uh, is going to be used to help purify the people but in order to become pure they have to be defiled at least the person who is offering the red cow because they're you know they're coming in contact with ashes and so forth and then 
exactly why is a red cow and you know you, you can talk about the redness and the blood and the sin but at the end of the day it's like huh okay i guess we'll just do what god says and and go from there but it, it there's i mean that's an important thing to do what god says because he says it yet um it it's i think deeper than that uh you know that that's on i think a fundamental level i'll do what god says just because he said it and that's important and we should do that but god's commands are never arbitrary and um yet there are those that through human intelligence we can't say clearly why you know this command is this or that and i think it opens up you know for us for exploring reasons um one person wrote a book on theology miglior is his name and he defined theology as faith seeking understanding and so uh, we have faith, we have trust, and we seek to understand that. We seek to understand God more fully. So God, I mean, in his, the only way you can understand God is if he reveals himself, and he reveals himself in his word. And so sometimes it, like the red cow, it just doesn't seem, you know, why, why this? But it may be, you know, red is... Uh, is color of blood and red is also portraying sin and Isaiah and on the things associated with it. So it brings thought, but the rabbi say, this is a kukat and it is, um, it defies human intelligence. It is interesting. Again, that, you know, we have something about a cow that's, it's making, that has some prominence. Uh, and then it's, it, there's, it's always in the background, seemingly always in the background. Uh, of our consciousness of you would think of the Israelites consciousness as well of the golden calf. That's always around. I mean, right. yeah. And, and so, you know, again, the tie between what happened with the golden calf and then almost anything that, that uh, comes later, particularly when you start referencing other cows, uh, it, it's kind of hard not to start making some associations between the two. Yeah, so you got you have Aaron and you have a cow here, and then earlier we had a calf and we had had Aaron, and some even say it's the the cow red cow here atones for the sin of the golden calf, as if to say, let the mother come and clean up the mess that's left by the child, and so the golden calf will be the child, and this red cow here. Um, and, and the fact that it's red, you know, and, and the, the rabbis say it couldn't have more than two hairs that were not red. But the fact that it's red it is symbolic. I mean, colors are symbolic and important. Uh, it was not to have ever worn a, or borne a yoke. And they say that symbolizes the sinner who cast off the God's yoke from himself. And God's yoke many times in the rabbinical writings refers to Torah. You take upon yourself willingly the yoke of God's Torah. Um, and the uh, fact that this cow is burned and Aaron burned, uh, cast the gold into the fire and out came the calf. Then you have the cedar wood and the hyssop and the thread and all of that they say signifies sin and repentance and the sinner is, is mighty and haughty like a cedar tree, but then it's brought low um through a, a blade of hiss hyssop grass and as a and of a worm so all of that again is supposition but you know it 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 makes sense so is there anything to be made out of or discussed by the fact that this uh i guess ritual uh the the offering or the of this uh red cow is killed outside of the camp, killed out, unlike bringing it into the tabernacle where it's, you know, to be sacrificed that, you know, this is something that happens outside the camp. Uh, well, that's where the unclean, you know, is taken. And um, maybe that's saying you can't bring that into the camp. I don't know. I don't know. Um, some uh, use the verse nine, gather up the ashes and lay them outside the camp. 
in a clean place. Um, and then it's tied in with this water sprinkling and that's tied in also probably when number six of the strange ritual of the man who, who accuses his wife of, of uh, unfaithfulness. Right. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not a sacrifice in the true sense of the word as, as uh, in your notes and as we discussed, because it's not, it's not made on the altar, it's made outside the camp in a sense. And again, you know, different than what we've been experiencing with all the other sacrifices and how they've been laid yeah. out and brought in, but still just as important. And, and again, we, uh, we talked about it in, in, in the introduction or alluded to it, the fact that all these individuals who come in contact are unclean, at least through the evening, right? And so then they're going to have to make a sacrifice themselves in order to become clean again. So uh, yeah, it was the just Midrash says that there's a paradox there. It's ashes purify people who become contaminated. And yet those who engage in the preparation of the ashes become contaminated. And so it's, it's the same idea as we talk about the unclean and clean and holy and common. And so it's, I, I think if we think about it, as we're looking back, that we're still looking for the future when nothing unclean will enter into the presence of, of God. And so it's powerful pictures of that. We have to be careful, you know, with pushing things. But they, I think they're being taught you don't approach God contaminated. Things have to be done. And, and I don't know if there was a, a reference, and I didn't see it. Um, again, sometimes I overlook things that's right in front of me. But, you know, why or when this particular purification ritual is to, to be undertaken? Um, uh, I don't know. I think it's... Uh, It's, I guess, if there were unclean things. I don't, I don't know, really. Yeah, it's just, again, in this whole, because the rest of this chapter lays out, you know, the different uh, things that should be done for coming into contact uh, with the corpse or something else that's going to make them unclean. So you see this theme throughout the entire chapter of, of individuals becoming unclean uh, and what that means and what they should do in order to put themselves in the right state. Nick asked the question, didn't most birth offerings require the hide to be removed? Uh, and I, I think some of them were, I mean, a whole, a whole burnt offering would be, the whole thing would be burned. Uh, but I don't remember. I don't remember. And you remember in the first part of Leviticus, you have all those sacrifices set out in the way uh, and the hide was removed. From many of these, um, well, those were sacrificial animals. Yes, uh, for for sin. Yeah, the burnt offering was not for sin primarily. Yeah, it was dedication to God. I'm wondering if that had any significance. The hide being on that animal. I, don't I remember. Know. Uh, Is the whole hide burned here? Yeah, verse five says the cow shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, flesh, and blood shall be burned. It's dung included. Yeah. Uh, you know, so never pretty much everything with it or about it. I don't know, really. I, I would say it's Kukai. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, as we, we, as I just mentioned, you know, this whole chapter, uh, is all about different rituals when people die and how, you know, you come in contact with the corpse when that might take place. Is there anything about uh, in the rest of chapter 19, is there any questions anybody else has or anything else, Ben, you'd like to say before we might move on? Well, again, you know, it's the idea of the sanctuary being kept clean and not defiling it. And sin is just piling up, piling up. And there are all kinds of sacrifices daily. And then you have Yom Kippur uh, to cleanse the sanctuary. And so, you know, from uh, believers in, in uh, Jesus as Messiah, um, he, his sacrifice feels full of meaning all of this. He fulfilled all of this. You know, and I think it's, at least for me, you know, maybe it's that uh, uh, 
lack of intelligence on my part uh, that makes this all uh, kind of uh, hard to understand at times. But I'm not sure we get a true sense of just how big an operation the whole sacrificial system had to be for an entire nation, you know, and whatever numbers you want to put on that, anywhere from 600,000 to a few million people, whatever your numbers are, you know, that's just to think about how often sacrifices had to be made and, and, and the, the administration and the fact that a whole tribe was committed to doing just this, uh, by the time, you know, it, it, for me, if you can get your head wrapped around that, then when you get to the New Testament and you see, you know, Christ once and for all and the only sacrifice, a single individual making it, 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 it does draw quite a big contrast and uh, distinction in places, I think, it, such an importance on it, uh, on that sacrifice that Christ made and, and puts it in a context that, again, I'm not sure we completely understand or, or appreciate when we compare it to, you know, it's easy to say the bloods of bulls and goats didn't take. OK, but what does that really mean when you, when you think about how often that had to be done uh, in the Old Testament for it not to be have to be done ever again after Christ? Yeah. And I, and I don't think the attitude should be or, or at least my attitude is not, boy, I'm glad I don't live back then. We'd have to do all this kind of stuff. The attitude should be how great is the sacrifice of Christ if all of this burden is on the people. As John the Baptist says, you know, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so, I mean, they, they, they experience grace and they experience forgiveness as well because God forgives uh, the animals. Blood cannot forgive. Um, but it's not the idea of, uh, boy, I'm glad, you know, that I didn't live back then. It should be the idea of, of, you know, all of this is placed upon Christ and he bore all this. The magnitude, I think it's conveying the magnitude of sin. Yeah. I mean, because it, like you said, it's a whole withdrawn, you know, drawn out thing. And um, why would God go to that extreme? I think it's to show the, the terrible nature and the magnitude of sin and also that he's holy absolutely well i'd like to move into chapter 20 if there's no other questions or comments and and, and i want to talk about the magic rock <laughs> uh ben shaking his head yeah uh the, this chapter opens um as compared to what we see with Aaron and Moses, when they die later on, this, this chapter opens somewhat um, anticlimactic is not the right word I'm looking for, but, uh, you know, very just sort of matter of fact and, uh, and, and barely gives much uh, lip service or, or, or ink to the passing of Miriam. And, uh, you know, she's been an important Part through the story of uh, before the wilderness and, and in Egypt and so forth. And, and now it's just, oh yeah, Miriam dies. Uh, and then we have on the heels of that uh, a, a story I know we're, we're all familiar with, with, you know, rock, uh, water coming from the rock and how we get to that point and then the ramifications from, from Moses and Aaron, which we'll talk about soon. But uh, this idea of, being, of Miriam and, and and the fact it's just kind of mentioned in passing and uh, is, is seemed to be quite a contrast to what we would expect. Yeah, it is strange. And I, I don't know, you know, I can't explain it, but you have, you know, 21, they come um, here uh, at Kadesh and there Miriam died and was buried. I mean, later uh, we're going to see the people um, wept and mourned at, Day at uh, Moses' death, and also wept and mourned at Aaron's death. But it just says, There Miriam died and was buried. But then in verse 2, now there was no water for the community. Uh, throughout, if you examine this, and the rabbis have pointed this out, that Miriam is associate, associated with water. I mean, you have Miriam uh, drawing Moses out of the water. 
And here you have Miriam dies, and then verse 2, there's no water. And uh, the rabbis say that, um, that there's this whole drawn out story that the water, there was a well or a rock that brought water that followed the Israelites around. And in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul seems to be playing on that, and he knows that story because he says that rock was Christ. I don't think Paul buys into the whole story, but it's an ancient rabbinical story. We'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. But um, so as soon as the righteous woman Miriam dies, Rashi says the water stopped. And then that leads into disastrous consequences um, later when the people are grumbling. Because we, we, we're familiar with them grumbling about being in the wilderness and familiar with them grumbling a lot about the food they had to eat or didn't have to eat, depending on how you want to look at that. And now we're going to see that they start grumbling about the water. Yeah. Right. And it's always something. And, it, and I think it is interesting that, uh, you know, it, it does, Miriam dies and then there is this story about the fact that there, there is no water. Uh, and we don't know chronologically where we are here. Some say this is the last year of the wandering or uh, the previous generation has died because it says the whole Israelite community arrived here. Uh, but we don't know chronologically where, where we are in this. Um, and so there's this water problem again. Well, the water problem, uh, as I said, leads into the story that we're uh, most familiar with. Uh, and that is that, you know, as in, in verse five, there's not even water to drink. That's their complaint. There's not even water to drink. And so verse six, Moses and Aaron came away and they fall down in front of the tent of meeting. And uh, the, the Lord appears to them and speaks to them and tells uh, Moses you and your brother Aaron take the rod and assemble the community and before their very eyes order the rock to yield its water. So here we have the Lord saying, you know, speak to the rock uh, and then it will uh, provide the water uh, that they need. Now this whole rock that followed them around the rabbinical story is that God created a rock as a source of miraculous water. And it was, um, it was the rock back there when when Abraham cast out Hagar in Genesis 21, and the Ishmael's they're about to die of thirst. That an angel revealed to Hagar this rock, and it's the same rock in Exodus 17 that Moses um, gets water from that from that rock. And so this same rock is around is the rabbinical story. Um, and you can look at 1 Corinthians 10 for what Paul says about the rock. That, um, and that rock was Christ. But he's commanded here to speak to this rock. And we know he does. He strikes the rock. But. And I, we'll get it in verse 11. And I, I'm, I only mention it maybe a little bit out of order, you know, that he uh, raised his hand, he struck the rock. We'll get to that in a second. But, uh, you know, out came the water for the community and their animals or their beasts to drink. And, and I want to talk about, uh, because I, I, in our preparation, I did find this idea of uh, how the people linked together, how they saw themselves and their animals, how God saw the, the people and the beast. And then how it actually plays out after Moses strikes the rock. Uh, if you if you could explain, maybe set that up a little better than I did, and explain, you know, sort of what the Hebrew, how the language, you know, uh, lays this out for us, because I think we lose it in the translation, uh, because we just say, you know, animals and beasts, and we don't maybe see uh, the 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 underlying text there. I mean, you can have like um, a definite direct object. And uh, there is a sign for that in Hebrew, it's et. And uh, you can say et, people, and water. Or you can say et, people, and et, or I'm, I'm sorry, let me start, I've said people and water. Uh, et, people, and animals. 
or you can say at people and at animals. That's making a distinction between the people and the animals. So in verse four of chapter 20, they say that we and our livestock should die here. They're putting them, there's no distinction. They're viewing themselves together with their livestock, with their animals. In verse eight, when God commands Moses to speak to the rock, he says, you'll bring water out of the rock for the people and for their animals or their livestock. He, he separate, grammatically, he separates the people from their animals. Then when Moses strikes the rock and God says, you didn't give me glory, the result there in verse 11 is the water gushed out and the people and their animals drank. There's no distinction at all. And so it may be making too much from this little particle in Hebrew of et, but the rabbis say God wanted a distinction between the people and the animals. And the people viewed themselves together with it's like, you know, we both need, need water. And so God wanted a distinction. Moses didn't honor God or glorify God in this. And so tragically, there was no distinction between the people and, and their animals. It's like, I mean, it, we share something as humans with animals and um, a animating spirit, but humans are not animals because humans are created, the theologians say, imago Dei, in the image of God. So that, that distinguishes us. We have an animated life principle, nefesh kaya in Hebrew, um, that animals have. Uh, yet we are a mago day. We're an image of God, and whatever that may mean. And we probably explored a couple of things when we were in Genesis. But it's almost like they're they're on the same level as their animals in needing water. Yeah, it's like they themselves are saying we're no better than the animals. We're all in this together, and yeah, on the same level. And it, it, it seems it, it it again whether <laughs> making too much out of it, I don't know. But it, to me, it adds some importance here to think that God wanted to show that at the end of the day, so to speak, no, you are, you are my people. Your people. Yeah. And, and God wants, uh, um, people there, there is, um, blessing in receiving food and blessing in receiving water. It's enjoyable. And yet also it's blessing, uh, Hebrew people, uh, bless before the meal and bless after the meal, thinking that you've had the meal. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's more than just let's eat or let's drink this water. And so they seem to be on this level here, this animal level. We need water. And God doesn't want that, but Moses doesn't glorify God. And so it ends up being that. Okay, here's your water. Well, let's talk a little bit about that so we can pull this together and the fact that... Can I ask a question on all that? Yes. Uh, is that from Jewish tradition or what? But doesn't say, to me, I'm looking here, is there anything in the text that would imply that God was upset because the people were equating themselves balanced with animals? From what I get from it is he is upset with Moses and Aaron because they didn't give him the glory for the water being supplied. He, yeah, I, I agree with you. He's upset with that. But it, the construction of the Hebrew from verse 4 and verse 8 and verse 11 is different. Verse 4 and verse 11 is, is the same in the construction of the Hebrew. Verse 8 is not. And so verse 4 is what the people want. Verse 11 is what happened. Verse 8 is what God tells Moses to do. And so the construction of the Hebrew, it, it may be pushing it, but it seems in verse eight that God doesn't view the animals on the same level as the people. And so, he's gonna, but you're, I mean, you're I'm exactly just saying, right. Reading it, read, reading it from the text that we have, you can't, you, you can't decipher that. No, it's in, the, it's in the Hebrew, yeah. Yeah, right. And that, that was the 
point I was making was that it was it, when I've learned of this, when I first heard Ben and I talk about it, it, it provided some additional uh, importance, right? And again, because of reemphasizing the fact that that God elevates his people. And, and as you're talking about, Nick, what, what gets in the way of that happening? Well, it's Moses disobeying God. And certainly God's upset with that. God's upset with that. And, yeah. that, and so we, we move into that and we know that uh, we don't have a lot of material here to work with, but, you know, God tells him, his, you're going to speak to the rock. And then, uh, so Moses takes the rod in verse nine, uh, in verse 10, they assemble the congregation in front of the rock. And, and then Moses, for whatever reason, again, it's sort of reading from the text, he calls them, you rebels, shall we get water for you out of this rock? And then he raises his hand and strikes the rock twice with his rod, and out came lots of water, uh, and the community and their beast drank. And, and so, we, as you said, we see this happening, uh, and we see the construction in the Hebrew has been just outlined, and what gets in the way is God, as Moses, for whatever reason, and we can talk about that, uh, not doing what God said, and the consequences, because we can't have that conversation without the consequences that, to us, I would think we would agree, seem way over the top for what amounts to a sing, uh, you know, seemingly a single act of disobedience by a person who up to this point has been considered and is considered one of the most humble individuals uh, of all time. God says that of him and has been doing God's will from the beginning. And yet his actions lead to being denied entrance into the promised land. So you, you've got a lot going on here in what amounts to just a few verses. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, fundamentally what it is, is God says, you didn't glorify me. And, um, it's, it, it, I mean, you know, how's this play out? He does say, shall we give you water? And I think that's probably the part of the problem or the fundamental problem. He didn't give glory to God. And it wasn't just simply he struck the rock when, when God said, speak to the rock. Um, so it, it's later on, we're going to see he pleads with God and he says, God was angry with, with, he tells the people, God was angry with me for your sake. And I'm, I'm not entering into the land and he pleads with God and God said, that's it. I don't want to hear any more about it. You're not entering into the land, but, um, yeah, it's more than just striking the rock when God said, speak to the rock. It's he didn't give God the glory in this. And Aaron's involved in this as well. I mean, his language there in verse 10 is pretty strong. I mean, listen, you rebels. And, you know, he perhaps they were, and he felt that, you know, many times, but um, I think, um, uh, it, it shows the humanity of Moses. Yeah. I mean, again, if God's looking, you know, there, there's nothing to indicate that God was going to act differently toward his people, right? I mean, they, they can, yeah, they're complainers. We get that. But he's always given them the food they needed. He's always provided for them. And there's nothing to indicate that he wasn't going to provide for them again. And he says to Moses and Aaron, I'm going to. But then, like you just said, there's something... So something has to happen, uh, you know, seemingly, you know, between, you know, verses eight, nine and 10, where, where Moses calls them rebels and apparently has an attitude, uh, has something going on. And Aaron's uh, and equally going. at fault here. Just as culpable, right. Uh, in verse 12, uh, because you didn't trust in me enough to honor me as holy. And, um, and here's another thing that's interesting is, you know, when the people griped before and then they griped when the spies, um, you know, and over all that and cried all night. And God said, well, this generation is not going in the promised land. Um, this appears to be the second generation. He could have done that again. Well, OK, well, you griped over the water. You're not going in. But he, he says Moses and Aaron will not go in. Um, 
So, and then in verse 11, he gave them water. Yep. We just, I don't know whether we have all the information that we'd like in this, but I think to stay with the text, fundamentally, we can say that Moses and Aaron didn't trust in God to honor him as holy. And we didn't even talk about the disagreeing magical rock. <laughs> yeah, some people are, some of the rabbis say, uh, God said, speak to the rock. And it's that rock that the rabbis talk about. Moses couldn't find it. <laughs> so he spoke to him or he struck this rock. Um, find real rock so he strikes a second one yeah yeah i know that we had already had some questions anything about that section um before we move on through the rest of this chapter um, i mean verse 13 um it's they named that place merivah which means quarreling and then because the israelites quarrel with the lord then it says where he was proven holy among them he was proven holy among them. Is he proven holy in giving the water? Or he was sanctified in them? I don't know. And Moses and Aaron didn't portray him as holy give or to give glory to him. Then I think it'd be because he had provided for them. Yeah, that it's shows it provided for them. But yes. yeah, that's just my thought. Yeah, because they the water came out of the rock. Um, what whatever it means, and you know, we may struggle and wrestle with the severe consequences of Moses and Aaron and their sin, but um, from a practical standpoint, God's leaders, the leaders of God's people must must show God as, as holy. Absolutely. Well, as we leave that event and move into the rest of chapter 20, uh, the Israelites are on the move and they're coming uh, to Edom and Moses is going to send a message uh, to the king of Edom and ask for some passage and uh, they're going to get denied and it's going to happen again. Uh, even in the same chapter, but uh, it, it's interesting, you know, that sort of again, who's in charge, uh, what, where your strength is found, uh, and, and how that plays out in the Israelites' life and perhaps even our life on a regular basis. And I think setting up maybe the difference between where the Israelites put their faith and in whom they put their faith compared to where Edom seems to put its faith uh, is worth a little discussion here, Ben. Yeah, and remember that, you know, the background to Edom, Edom is Esau, um, and Israel is Jacob. So you have that Jacob Esau. And uh, here, um, when they're asked, you know, can we pass through in verse 14, this is what your brother Israel says. And uh, then in verse 16, as they go through the, their history, we cried out to the Lord and he, he heard, he heard our voice, he heard our, our cry. So the Israel's strength, Israel's power is that God hears their cries. God, God answers. And that doesn't seem to make much of, a, of an impact on Edom. Because in verse 18, Edom answered and says, you may not pass through here. And if you try, we'll march out and attack you with the sword. And so Edom's strength is the sword. And so a sword is powerful and an army is powerful, but it's not as powerful as God. And, and scripture po points that out several times. And so Israel's strength is in their cries to God and God hears. Edom's strength is in their sword. And that goes back uh, to uh, Rashi says to Genesis 27 and verse 40. In Genesis 27, you have uh, Esau 
um, saying to his father, do you have only one blessing? My father bless me too. And he wept aloud. And his father Isaac said, your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness. And then he says, verse 40, you will live by the sword and you will serve your brothers. So I think that, I mean, those are uh, interesting lessons. Where is Israel's strength and where is Edom's strength? Uh, yeah, even Moses even asked twice and is denied, you know, twice um, for that to happen. And they're, and they're saying, you know, we're not going to bother anything. We're not going to take anything. And, you know, we'll even, uh, um, we will not go through any field or drink water from any well. Um, it, it seems this, you know, the second time he said, okay, we'll just go along the main road. But both times you may not pass through. And so much so in verse 20, Edom comes out with a large and powerful army. And we're going to see that multiple times, even again here shortly in this passage. Uh, it, we may talk about it, we may not, but you know, continually the Israelites are confronted, you know, by these different small little, probably small little kingdoms, little nations, little little groups of people that you know they they demonstrate their power, try to anyway by by the sword by trying to fight. You know, again we talked about sort of the anti. Again, I may not be using the right word anticlimactic with Miriam and her death, but uh, it just is Miriam's death just kind of factual right here. Miriam is and she died. And it's interesting, you know, the next verses that follow. Uh, they go up onto the mountain, uh, Mount Mount Hor and, and uh, God tells Moses and Aaron, hey, Aaron, you're going to be gathered to your kin. Um, and you're not going to enter to the land because you disobeyed my commands about the, the rock and the waters. Uh, take off your vestments and, you know, give them to your son, Eleazar. Um, and then Aaron shall be gathered. And that's what happens. And, it, and it's sort of, I, I can't imagine going up into the mountain uh, and being told by God, yeah, you're not going down, you know, and you're going to die. You'll be gathered to your kin and, and, you know, going to pass it on to your son. It just seems again, kind of, a. Uh, uh, I wish we had more information about this. I wish we knew more. I'd love to know what Aaron's thinking, right? I mean, most of us rarely know when our death is going to happen. And certainly if we do, sometimes we have time to plan or, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any time here. It's just, it just happens. Uh, and then Aaron's dead because, you know, it says he comes off the mountain and the people realize Aaron's gone. It's right on the heels of that, of that rock water incident. Right. right. And, um, and he, I mean, he, he tell, just like we've seen before, um, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Aaron, I get Aaron standing there, I guess, you know, Aaron will be, he won't enter the land that I'm, I've given to the Israelites. And because both of you rebelled. And so Aaron, El Elazar, and Moses go up this mountain. And then two come down, Moses and El Elazar. But uh, Aaron died there on the top of the mountain, it says. And, and then you have the, the whole community mourning for him 30 days, which places the fact that Miriam died and was buried in, in more contrast, I think. There's no mourning period, at least none recorded. Yeah, none uh, recorded. And we know from uh, uh, that 30 days is longer than a traditional seven. So they're certainly giving Aaron, you know, uh, a great uh, recognition in that regard, as they will Moses later. Uh, but yeah, just this whole idea. And, and that's the passing. And, you know, here we have the passing of uh, the priesthood, just like that, right? I mean, take the vestments off the high priest, pass it to your son. And, and then the, the process continues from then on. But uh, it's just, again, given what, how much, how much time we spend about a red cow, <laughs> you know, we got very little information here about something as significant and important as the, the passing of the priesthood. Yeah. And, 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 and I think we've talked about this before. I mean, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam were important people. Um, <clears throat> yet no person is indispensable. 
Uh, there's there's no indispensable man in any any preacher any church leader who thinks they're indispensable sometimes you know preachers may get the idea well if i leave that congregation just you know just die that's uh, i mean god will raise up somebody else um and so he was moses the same, and moses as great as he was exactly it's not like the israelites came to an end yeah uh, none of us are indispensable right. and the idea too maybe is that you know god God works through a certain person for a certain time and their time is over here on earth and his work still continues um, on. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Well, I'd like to spend the last 10, 12 minutes that we have uh, of our allotted time or scheduled time uh, talking about chapter 21. Uh, again, we'll certainly entertain any questions over chapter 20, but uh, to set up 21, we're going to talk about this bronze serpent uh, and, and what God, how God uses the serpent in the first place, our serpents, the raising of the bronze serpent as a means of protection, and then maybe tie that into John chapter three, Ben, about Christ uh, being looked upon uh, in a similar way. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting uh, thing here. You have... Uh... In verse four, they're traveling, and the the NIV says the people grew impatient on the way. Um, that's just that's sort of an understatement. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. The the people, uh, the the soul of the people was uh, shortened. They grew impatient on on the way. And then they spoke against God and against Moses again. And it, it's the same old thing over and over. I mean, you know, there's no water, there's no food. Uh, we detest this miserable food. And so the Lord sent these venomous snakes. And we know this account, you know, uh, they came to Moses and said, we've sinned and, uh, uh, we spoke against the Lord and against you. And so pray that the Lord will take these snakes away from us. So Moses prayed and the Lord said to Moses, you make this snake, you put it on a pole and the one who is bitten can look at it and live. And he made a bronze snake, and put it on a pole. And uh, we we're probably familiar with the later history of this. In 2 Kings 18, in the time of King Hezekiah, they dug that, that bronze snake has been around for a long time. I guess they stored it in a back room, you know, or something. And so they dug it out and they started worshiping it. And um, it became an idol and it, it was destroyed. Then you fast forward to John chapter 3 and Jesus' nighttime discussion with Nicodemus. Um, and he talks about this incident here, and he says, as that snake was raised up, so the Son of Man will be raised up. It's, um, it's interesting that Jesus would choose that illustration. It, it is, particularly given, like you just said, the history. It's not as if it, the only history of the bronze serpent was uh, a means of sort of salvation or healing uh, from the various serpents. Uh, it becomes associated apparently for quite some time uh, as an idol uh, yeah. or something. I don't, again, if it's not used as idol, certainly something magical, something outside of God's, you know, expectations and purview. And then, you know, it takes on a, 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 a negative connotation. And here, like you said, Christ is using it uh, positively. And I know the rabbis had uh, some thoughts about, you know, how people were healed are uh, from the, the snake bites. And, and I, I can only think and imagine that must be how Jesus is sort of using uh, this, this incident, incidents. Yeah, the rabbi said, it's not the magical thing of looking to that that saved you. It was the idea of God is the one who is, who is saving um, to, the, to the father who's in, in heaven who's saving. Um, we're told in 2 Kings 18, verse 4, that um, Hezekiah removed the high places 
smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles, and he broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Uh, it was called Nehushtan. Um, Nehushtan sounds like bronze, and uh, it's also kind of tied in with the word for snake. But then Jesus tells Nicodemus, as the, the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so I'll be lifted up. Yeah. And, and in the notes I had, you know, it wasn't magical, yeah. right? but it, it was this idea of you're looking to the Father in heaven. There, there's something about the looking up, you know, here it is, the, the, the bronze on this standard on this pole, and, you know, you're sort of looking up at it. You know, they didn't want to equate that with anything magical. It's like, well, you're lifting your eyes, so you must be looking at the Father in the heaven. Um, and so, like I said, you know, perhaps that's the same idea of you're looking up to see Jesus crucified uh, eventually, uh, and, and, and it's not you know, nothing magical about any of this. It's just, this is how it's taking place. And John plays on words as well. You know, I mean, he uses like lift it up. Uh, you lift someone up to honor them, but also Jesus will be lifted up and he'll be lifted up on the cross. Um, and so when you look to him as he's lifted up and, uh, you honor him. Then, then you live. Absolutely. Question. Yes. Question about that. Uh, you, we went back earlier in the lesson when we first started the lesson. We were talking about, you know, sometimes we just have to do things because God tells us to. Yeah. Basically, we do them because it's a matter of faith. And I look at this as it's the same type of thing. You know, it's, it's a matter of faith. This will, this will cure you. It's like baptism. There's no logical reason the baptism cleanses you of your sins. Logically, but the Lord told us to do. It. So we need to do what the Lord has instructed us to do. Yeah. And that's the same thing to me with this fiery serpent. It's not really nothing magical. It's just God has said to do it, you know, cause and effect. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. So and it's well, tied in with what, simple? it's tied in with what is they're suffering. Simple? Um, they lifted up the, the serpent, and so they look to the serpent. They're being bitten by serpents, so it's, it's tied in that way. And yet, I, I would agree, you know, we, we can't work all this out. God saves, and God saves through the serpent that's lifted, and God saves uh, through baptism as a burial. Um, not like baptism is some magical place. Um, I mean, Paul, you can go back to First Corinthians 10, <clears throat> and it seems that Corinthians had the idea, we're baptized and we take the Lord's Supper, so we're good. And Paul says, look at the history of Israel. Um, not all of them listen to God. So it's not, not some magical thing. And, and yet baptism has great meaning. I mean, it's a burial. It's a... It's a we die and we're buried and we're raised up. And I mean, if I were bitten by a snake, you know, it, it had great meaning. You, you'd look for that bronze snake. <laughs> Absolutely. Did I mention I don't like snakes? Yeah. <laughs> you sound like my wife. She come into the house one day. Said, There's a snake in the backyard. Mm -hmm. You scared it off by the time I got there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ben, we just have a couple of minutes uh, left, and, and I just want to make reference. It was kind of interesting uh, as we get down to verse 14. We have a reference to a, a, a book that doesn't exist, as far as we know, anymore. Uh, and it's not the only reference. Uh, we have, there's some other books that are mentioned throughout the uh, Old Testament, particularly, that uh, don't appear to exist anymore. And this is the book of the wars of the Lord. Um, and the fact that I guess that they would record the different conflicts, the different battles that took place, um, the different uh, things, because eventually you know, we'll see that there's poems that are written, sort of the, you know, honoring uh, the 
the bards, as we would say in kind of the medieval times, you know, the guys who went around singing the different stories of, of what took place, the different heroes. And I guess there's some tie here, you know, to that. But uh, again, I just think it's interesting that there's mention to a, to another book that we don't have that uh, is, is recording something that the Lord did do or say. Yeah. And is, is there, are there any quotes from that book of the wars around anywhere? And the reason I've asked, I just finished reading a book about the destruction of Jerusalem. And it quotes, it's got a lot of references to the book of wars. And I had no idea what they were talking about until tonight, Chris. So it's just, you know, it's, it came in. So, well, the only quotes, quotes from it or where did, you know, where did this guy get these? Um, no, there's not. Uh, there's not a book that you can find that has that unless you have like little snippets here. What verse is that in? Verse 14, and then it, it sort of records some things in verse 15 as well. Uh, so those are the those are the quotes that we have. Yeah. And um, it, like you have in Joshua, Yash, Yashar. Um, Yashar means upright. Yashar means upright. Yashar upright. And uh, so... Some say, you know, it was common for armies to have people that travel around and they would uh, record um, different, you know, battles and keep a record of all that. You have Egyptian records of that and Babylonian and all that. And it's not anything strange to think that God's army would have that as well. And so the book is not I anywhere. I stand corrected. It was not the book of wars. It was wars. And it was about the siege of Jerusalem. So I, yeah, I that's written corrected. by, I just saw that. that's written by Josephus. You can find that. Okay. Um, Josephus wrote about, he was an eyewitness of the destruction of Jerusalem and he wrote of the wars. So you can, you can read that. He, uh, he exaggerates a lot is what some scholars say, but uh, you can read what he says. Well, as our chapter comes to a close, we see again, you know, the idea of Bo just asking for permission to go through certain lands. And again, kings, like in this case, uh, Shehan uh, saying no, uh, and then Israel putting him to the sword. Uh, so not just skirting around the issue, but we're actually going to go to battle. And, and I think it's interesting. Uh, I, I kind of, I find it just a little bit funny. You get down to verse 32, Moses sent to spy out uh, Yazir and they captured its dependencies and dispossessed the Amorites who were there. It's like, we may send out more spies this time. We're not making that same mistake twice. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and so they, they captured the land. And, and, and I think here you see this idea that whether they're capturing the land, some of it they stay in and reside in others. I think they cap, they, they go into battles in order to uh, move through territory, but Unfortunately, as they come out of the wilderness, and I think we're going to see more of this certainly in Deuteronomy, and then we obviously we had time to go into Joshua Judges, but God's been leading them and providing for them all their needs in this wilderness, uh, and they kept complaining, and now they're moving into a, a period of their history where God still provides, but he's expecting them to, to have to fight for it, and it's just, you know, they complained about, we wish we were still in Egypt. Well, they're going to really wish they were still in Egypt in some ways when they're having to go through these battles. Uh, and, and I think, again, we're, we're seeing a distinction drawn between, you know, what God's done for them in the wilderness. And now as they sort of exit the wilderness, what that future is going to look like, maybe partly because of their actions and what they've done and complained about and how they've responded during a time that should have gone in some ways much different for them. Yeah, and, and back in verse 24, chapter 20, when Aaron's not going into the land, God says, it's the land which I have given. And he didn't say the land I will give. It's a perfect in Hebrew. It's the land I have given. So the land is given, but the Israelites have to take the land. And they can't take the land on their military strength. They take the land because the battle belongs to the Lord. Um, and again, it's it's their strength is in is in the Lord and their cry to Him, but it's it's a different thing when you have to go out there and fight now, as you said. 
but it's fighting with the assurance or the hope that the Lord has given the land. And so I guess, you know, do you trust that the Lord has given the land? Well, we've seen that when that question has sort of been asked before in this 40 year period, the answer hasn't always been. That's right. Uh, yes. Not until something, you know, sort of changes their mind. So, yeah, that's right. Well, we've come to the end of our period of study and uh, our time allotted for that anyway. And we're again grateful for your presence tonight and, contributions and uh, considerations and so thank you once again for for being with us and uh, as Ben's always saying it's a blessing and encouragement to us and, and we're grateful for that and, and thank you for your comments and for your questions and that's how we learn and uh, we wrestle back and forth and uh, we don't have all the answers uh, next next part is going to be interesting that's when we get into Balak and the talking donkey and Bilam and um uh, some interesting things there. So, uh, and there's some New Testament uh, references to that as well. So uh, that's next partial, but thanks again for being with us and thank you for your, uh, your, your comments and your questions and, uh, and continue to pray for the class as well. Um, the, the fundamental goal of the class is that we learn more about God and we give him glory and we seek to live that out in our, in our life. I mean, I fundamentally believe, and all I know all of us believe, that this is inspired scripture. This is not just some history class. And so uh, we're learning more about what God is like and what he loves, what he hates, and how we are to live before him. Okay, so thanks again. We'll ask James, if he will, to lead us in a closing prayer. Thank you, Father, for your ancient book for the lessons we learn from it and for the ways we can apply them. Thank you for our faith. Thank you for Jesus Christ and bless us with life, with health and with forgiveness. Thank you for Chris and Ben and all of us who gather at their feet to learn from your will. Protect us through Christ we pray, amen. Amen, thank you, James. Hope everybody has a good week. Rest of the week. See you later. Good night.